Well, hello, hello, hello. My name is Nathan Johnson, and um, I'm going to be doing a webinar today on creating balance and focus in makeup. So we're gonna give it a minute or two for folks to sign on, and then we're gonna dive right in. So we'll give it a second. Um, as we dive in, uh, one of the things I'll do, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a few minutes, here at QC, this is gonna be a first. Uh, we, we're all about education for our students and sharing makeup education and knowledge globally, universally, because there's so much misinformation about, hi Stacy, so much misinformation about makeup out there. So our belief is to get as much correct information out and circulating so that everybody can be more powerful as artists and have a uh, much greater opportunity to really practice their art instead of just working from wild creativity. I guess that's one of the, the best things that I can say. Um, so today we're going to talk about a whole bunch of awesome things that might cause you to think about makeup in a different way and sometimes I think one of the best things that we can do is think about things differently now if you if you're if you're taking QC and if um, if you work directly with me if I'm your tutor one of the things that you're gonna hear a lot is that I'm, I'm not just trying to get you to learn techniques I'm trying to get you to think differently because makeup is just about your mind and your eye as it is your hand what you think and what you see is gonna change what you do that's why when we work at, at makeup from that perspective from a thoughtful perspective and not just the perspective of wild artistry you're gonna be very capable of transforming so many 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 things that you do okay so uh, let's dive in first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and then I'm gonna talk to you more about what this webinar is gonna bees just so we can make sure the bulk of who wants to tune in for the beginning is going to be here if you're not sure who I am my name is Nathan Johnson I have the great privilege of being the executive makeup artist at QC um, I'm one of I'm the instructor in the videos along with in some of the advanced um, courses some additional instructors and um, I've had the 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 awesome journey of being in this industry for a really long time. In that time, I've worked with over 700 celebrity clients. They include people like Paul McCartney, Liza Minnelli, Alicia Keys, Kate McKinnon, Liam Michelle, Jennifer Tilly. I was the artist on two seasons of TV's Project Runway. I've been a global artist and educator for international brands, including Sephora, Cover FX, and others. I've written training manuals and educational materials for an extraordinary number of companies. But my biggest passion has always been educating, which is why I have done it alongside my professional career for so very long. So for those of you who, who take your art, your craft of makeup so seriously, I want to extend you um, an incredible thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to join me today because my the happiest thing that could ever happen for me is that all of your dreams will come true. That you will be able to accomplish each and everything that you want to in makeup. And the biggest part of that, one of the most important things, it starts with our education. It starts with how we learn. So I'm um, so incredibly glad that you're here. And today we're going to be talking about a whole lot of um, special things. The things that um, we're going to cover today. Sue, I'm so glad you could make it to a webinar. To everybody in Australia, to everybody tuning in when this is really not your time zone, that is dedication, my loves. So I'm so glad you're here. The first thing I want to say is there's going to be plenty of time for your questions at the end. So. If I don't answer your questions when they pop up, don't worry. My darling Karina, who is with, um, who's staying after hours at QC to make sure that everybody can get, um, everybody's questions will be ordered and that this is running in a, a fantastic way. She's going to feed me the questions at the end. So don't worry. If you leave your question in there, she's going to funnel it um, through to me at the end. And if you feel for some reason it's been skipped, it never hurts to put it in again. Nobody minds, right? Um, but your questions won't be answered till the end unless I spot one and it's super pertinent to what I'm talking about at that moment. But nobody will be forgotten because everybody's important, right? So um, you all should have gotten this handout. And I know she just put up a list talking to um, everybody about you know how to get the materials. And if they're not there and if for some reason you can't get it, don't worry. You don't need them as we talk about this. There's something you want, might want to have later for your reference. So don't worry. It's no need to panic if you don't have it because guess what? You can always draw the things out in your notebook if you're thinking about it because when you do brain and pet hand to pen you're, you're you change the way you think right and then I said that's a major part of the sort of thing that we're working on so don't worry if you don't have them it's no big deal you can get them later and anyone who wants them that doesn't have them will easily be able to get them because QC is great like that so it'll be super simple so um, before we dive in I want to tell you about um, the webinar special 
if you're considering being Laurie from Boston, my native land. I'm from the Berkshires. I'm from the other side. So I love seeing uh, I love seeing more Massachusetts people. I was gonna say that that nickname they call those of us from Massachusetts, but you never know how people will take it. But I know you know what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so um, there's a really awesome. Um, opportunity for people who want to sign up and start with QC. If you really want to get your basic um, education, which is really, really going to be an awesome way to learn the fundamentals of makeup that will give you an extremely powerful base to grow from. Master Makeup Artistry is the choice, and there's lots of advanced courses to follow it with. But if that's something you're considering, you can sign up now for, for much lower um, starting costs and payments, $89 a month, lower payments. You'll get a Master Makeup Artistry kit, and because it's our 35th anniversary, which is awesome, right? You're gonna get a super, super, super huge additional kit. You know, have a five-piece starter kit, nine shade, I'm, I'm reading this because there's so much, nine shade contour, um, highlight palette with four shades, four shades eyebrow palette, beauty sponges, five of them. You're gonna get a silicone um, brush cleaner, eyelash curler, eyelash applicator, four paws of four pairs of false lashes, which by the way, those false lashes are the very ones that I use on a lot of my celebrity clients. I'm obsessed with them, I love them. Um, and if you if you happen to see the makeup I just did for the Tony Awards and um, opening nights of these last Broadway shows, all my celebrities have had on the QC lashes. They're pretty amazing. And if you are a current existing um, student, don't worry. Don't worry. Um, if you enroll in an additional course, it will be 50% off and added bonus. Uh, you will get that additional awesome bonus item. So you'll get the 35th um, anniversary additional kits, um, no matter which course you sign up for. So I hope that's something you'll consider. Now, once again, today, and we're going to talk about that again at the end, so don't worry if you forget. Today, we're going to talk all about creating balance and focus in makeup. And one of the ways that's going to be so um, powerful about our doing this is we all think about where to place, but sometimes we don't think about finite details and how things add up and connect to our existing features and how that creates balance. You know, for those of you, <laughs> for those of you that are like me and are like, oh my God, I'm in the arts because I hated science. Well, I don't know. What can I tell you? Even here in makeup, there is science, there is math. So if you're anything like me and you, as soon as you got out of those courses, you were like, thank God. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, we're going to be dealing with a little of that today but at least it's from a, cre a creative um, perspective so it's gonna be a lot of fun it's gonna be a tremendous amount of fun okay so uh, with that being said one of the the biggest ways I guess I can explain this is have you ever looked at a makeup and just been like wow and you just can't stop staring at it and you don't know why and it might even be something so simple and clean and crisp and you just can't stop staring at it well here's the thing it's because it has balance and focus. Your eye can't help but get drawn to it. And when you understand balance and focus, you know how to guide people's eyes through and around the makeup that you're creating. So when we go through this webinar, at the very beginning, I'm gonna talk about the fastest, easiest ways to create focus. Everybody knows them, and if you don't, this will be a powerful refresher, okay? And then we're gonna get to talk into some specifics, some minutias that will be able to push you even further to really drive focus where you want it to be, and really considering the areas where you want focus to be, okay? So one of the most important things um, that I can say right away is, if you wanna be a brilliant makeup artist, theory is incredibly important. You gotta know why you're doing what you're doing, the angles behind it. I'm always, um, the, the students that I work directly with, you hear this from me all the time. Think about your makeup stroke by stroke. Why are you doing everything that you're doing? What is the reason behind it? If you're, there are two, I always look at it this way. There are, there are two kinds of makeup artists, right? Well, there are many, many, many kinds, but let's just be black and white for a minute, right? So if we're black and white for a minute, the things that you're gonna look at right here are, there are makeup artists who just work from wild creativity. I'm a makeup artist, oh my God, look at, look at how I can make everything dramatic and wonderful and super dark eyebrows, because I'm a makeup artist. And then there's people who really balance artistry with theory and technique. Do you see that why one might be more powerful than the other? Because here's the wild creativity, but here's wild creativity with reasoning. It doesn't mean you can't do new, inventive, novel things. Of course you can, and you should. But when you're doing them from the POV of thoughtfulness, of reason behind what you're doing, everything you ever aim to create is always going to have focus, dimension, and uh, balance to it, which is extremely important. So. 
you're going to notice that I'm going to be referring to my notes a lot. I wrote out like an unbelievable outline to make sure that I got you guys the most cohesive information possible. Because those of you who've tuned into these webinars before, I kind of have like a goldfish brain. All of a sudden I can be talking about something and go, oh God, where was I? Because I get really excited. So um, when you see me referring, it's just to all the notes that I, um, I pre-put together. And um, just so you guys know, um, if you aren't on our mailing list, put your email address below because one of the things that everybody's going to get from me at the end of this, it's not going to be today. It's going to either be tomorrow or a few days from now. I'm going to write you guys a recap of some of the information and the key points we hit on here so that you will be able to keep it with the diagrams that I gave you. Okay. And any notes you keep, it'll make the whole thing go together. So if we don't have your email address, just and if you're worried we don't, just type it in below. Um, or if you're worried someone will steal it and email you, we've never had that happen. Um, you can just email it directly to QC. Um, but make sure that you're on our mailing list so that you can get that follow up, okay? So, like I said, makeup is science. Understanding theory doesn't mean that you're trapped in a world of rules. It's quite the contrary. It means that you understand that there are guidelines that you can or cannot follow to make sure that what you're trying to do and create comes across. Um, in the palette you're working on, the palette being the face of the client you're working on. So when you understand theory, when you understand directionality, not only are you going to be able to drive focus, but you're really going to make sure that everything you create has an unbelievable balance to it. And ideally, in most cases, lifts the features. Because who wants their features to go like this? Nobody I've ever met. Who wants their features to go like this? Well, you know, not in that way. But everybody wants things to lift up because lifted looks younger. It looks more alert. It looks more awake, more alive. So we're going to learn about a lot about those those lines and how they can happen. But the most important thing that for me that you guys could walk away from here is do this for me. Going forward, if you ever find yourself just doing makeup, stop for a second and go, okay, at which point did I stop and go on autopilot? At which point did I stop thinking, why am I doing specifically this? Thinking that isn't going to make your makeup any longer. It actually might make it shorter because you're being so thoughtful about what you're doing. But I want you to train yourself to start thinking, when did I slip into autopilot? When did I stop really considering everything that I was doing? And that'll include not just how you build colors and build the whole look, but these angles, these directionalities. And it might take a while. Believe, believe me, I'll be honest with you, okay? I'm telling you this. One thing you'll know about me is I'm painfully honest. And one thing I've learned is I sometimes find myself going in autopilot. So the very first thing that I do is say to myself, okay, backtrack. Did I do anything that doesn't work or is perfectly appropriate for her features? And if you find that you've slipped into that category, just take a look at it. See if anything needs to be changed, removed, or switched. But the more, you're going to find sooner and sooner, you're going to get to the point where you start thinking about your choices at the beginning and you're able to carry through the entire 30, 45 minute hour of the application. That's a powerful thing and it'll serve you very well. Okay? So when we when we really start to understand balance and focus, and it's going to be through all kinds of things, depth of color that we use, it's going to be angles of makeup, but the important thing to remember is it's all of that. It's not one thing and only one thing. There's lots of ways to control it, and today we're going to kind of go into the specifics that people won't consider. Lines, angles, shapes, which have a huge impact, you know, on how our makeup looks at the end, right? So today we're going to talk about placement, shapes, lines. The very first thing that I want to do is talk about eyes. Now, for those of you that have them, it would be a good time to either take out your printouts or to open it up into a small section of your screen. Or if you are a visual, visual learner, just watch. Either way works, okay? Anything you want to do works. So the very first thing that we're going to look at here is the fastest way to cre create focus. Now, there are lots of variations in how you can do this and how you can balance it, but there are three ways to break it down incredibly simply. What is, I'll put this behind my ear for now, what is the absolute fastest way to balance focus um, and to drive focus where you want it to be? Well, it's concentration of color, right? So the very first thing, let's say we want to bring focus to the eyes. What's the absolute first thing that we can do? Bang. Now, if this is a little bright, I'm sorry, I'll try, to, I'll try to hold it just so. Bang, where do you look? You can't help yourself. You are sucked into the intoxicating, smoldering, smoky, beautiful eyes, right? So we've pulled your focus up there. Simple, quick way to do it. Another simple, super fast way to do it. Bang, where, where are you looking? Where are you pulled? You're pulled to the area where drama is created on the face, right? So what do you guys think is coming next? Now, I've shown you single focus. How can you do double focus? Well, it's really quite simple, right? Now, you see that you see that there's balance here. 
you're not like competing for where to go it ends up creating almost a circle that keeps pulling you around to the features whereas the other ones just hold you tight see if it's just the eyes they just they hold you tight if it's just the lips see they hold you tight and then when you have them all it's like a circle that keeps guiding you back up and around you split the difference now where do people end up in danger Part of the place that people end up in danger is when they fall into the Instagram YouTube trap or the trap of people who are untrained. Instagram and YouTube and untrained artists often make a lot of focal points. So if we've already said that intensity makes something a focal point, there's a guideline in makeup that says never have more than two focal points. You want one, two focal points, never more than two. So if you do an extremely aggressive cheek, what does that become? A focal point. Do you want people looking here or do you want people looking here? here here think about the things you want people to look at nobody's ever no now sometimes it's it's alluring when people are drawn to the mouth think about some of those old movies where when they talk in that way and you're just pulled into their mouths you know you can see the lipstick will often compliment there were certain celebrities who went with that lipstick that just sucked you in right but nobody's ever tried to suck you into their cheeks the cheeks don't do much for expression for communication these two things do eyebrows how often do you see people doing eyebrows that you can't help but stare at them? Do you want the eyebrows to be a focal point or do you want the eyes? The eyes are the window to the soul. The lips are a window to emotion. It's an immediate connection. It's how we feel, you know, ugh, you know? Like if I do something with my lips, you immediately know how I'm feeling. See what I mean? Like they're, they're, these communicate so much. The rest of this, it's secondary they join in the party but they aren't the, they're, they're never like the principal of the school they're always the assistants and teachers below these are the people who have all the voice so think about where you want it to be aggressive foundation guess what that does pulls the focus now am i say, saying that you can't do a heavier focus no you absolutely can but know what heavy focus really is if you're doing foundation a full face right heavy coverage it doesn't mean full coverage it doesn't mean it's heavy it just means everything looks so perfect but it doesn't look like makeup's there that's the balance that's what you learn in master makeup artistry right but when you start getting aggressive here 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 you start just uh, you know highlights contours strobes you end up becoming drawing focus to areas you don't want that's why I always say go back to those three and always remember if you want people to start to create that hypnotic look to your makeup I'm not saying you can't put highlight on like n notice I have a oh, whoops notice you I have a natural glow to my nose right here that's not because I put highlight on that's because there's a natural dewiness to my skin but if I turn that into a strobe you'd be staring at it know the balance know the difference I'm not saying you can't do anything and I'm not saying that there are rules I'm just saying if you understand guidelines you will have a much more specifically guided makeup that is much more likely to make people go Wow which is our goal at the end of the day whether simple or complex right so let's talk we're gonna talk about the eyes first since that tends to be one of the main windows people want to look at and then we're gonna to graduate to a whole bunch of air other areas of the face but when we go with the eyes first the very first thing that I want to talk about is eyeliner what is eyeliner eyeliner is a frame for the eyes now let's talk about it in its varying forms now there's lots of different ways to do eyeliner right and lots of variations here's some simple ones right now when we look first at what we're gonna call the natural liner what's the purpose of natural liner notice that it's incredibly thin all the way it doesn't get thicker 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 it stays thin what's the purpose of it the purpose of it when placed right along the lash line is to define the upper eye and in many cases you won't even know it's there but you'll know what it does because it makes the eyelashes look so thick and dense and it makes it look like they go all the way from inner corner to outer corner have you noticed how many people their eyelashes look like they disappear from here on in want to make them look like they're there eyeliner creates a line starts to create balance and guess what it does it draws focus it pulls focus and that's an extremely important thing bring that focus up all right because then what are we doing we're lifting we're pulling people here that's why you don't see have you ever seen makeups where people put lines on the cheek maybe for certain kind of things but where do you look you look there so when there's eyeliner even thin on the upper part of the eye you're you're drawing you're starting to draw focus and when you combine it with eyeliners you're intensifying that focus now believe me it's gonna get more complex than this because I know a lot of you know this it's basics but it never hurts to be reminded so let's talk about some variations in eyeliner let's look at these three um, we got the wedge We've got the the um, the the wrap around. We've got the cap. See, important things to remember here. Do you notice that in every single one of these, particularly look at these three here. Do you, well, boop, sorry, 
I'm going, I'm kind of going reverse. I'm watching myself. So go here, here, here. What's happening? <laughs> here, here, here. They all angle up. Why? Because anytime that you take your liners, and we'll talk about this with eyeshadows too, and you bring them below this corner of the eye, look at this line right here. Okay, see this line? Look, notice I go tear duct to tear duct, tear duct to outer corner. It's a horizontal line across the eye. Don't bring your eyeliners below it. Why? Why don't you want to do that? Because anytime you take a line and you bring it here, you do this. Now, not as dramatic, but you pull the eyes down. You make the eyes look droopy. That's the same thing. If you take your eyeliners here and you bring them beyond the inner corner, you pull the inner part of the eye down. Now, might there be specific times you want to do that for an editorial or a runway look? Sure. But remember, make sure it's choice and not habit. Once I teach this to you, you're suddenly going to look around and notice how many people take, and I'll show you, I'm going to show you another one in a second, another illustration, but you're going to notice how many people do eyeliners that don't actually flatter at all and actually distract from the features. And I promise you, if you started like walking around if, 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 tonight, you like went to a mall or you just looked around in your daily life, you will probably see it 50, 60, 70 times. It's just because people don't know, they don't understand. And that one change can transform and lift everything. Okay. So how to do all of these eyeliners is clearly outlined in the Master Makeup Artistry course, right? But you can see, you know, the wedge, the wrap around, wrap around literally just means the eyeliner rings the whole eye. It, 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 it makes for a really intense, glamorous look, right? Notice all of these, they start out thin, they get a little thicker, and each one of them, every single one of them adds more focus and length to the eye because the, the wedge adds, you know, height to the outer part, lifting the eye, so guess what lifts it even more when you have an angle that lifts even more so it's about you know defining the wedge lifts the cat really lifts so do you see how within each one of these there's reason behind it you're not just you're not always just doing a cat because you want to do a cat and if you watch instagram and youtube cat liner is the number one done liner but if you look around in the real world turn on your tv watch runways watch red carpets it's the least done right it's the absolute least done. Now, that doesn't mean it, it isn't reasonable, it's out of style, no. But that's the danger of just mindlessly copying people. It can set you apart from the real world, right? And again, makes you a copier. So, I want you to take a look at, let me see here, uh, da, 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 da. I talked about the, um, the line that cuts across. Okay, now what are some of the common mistakes in eyeliner that distract focus? Now, one of the first ones is when the lines are bumpy, bumpy and wobbly. All right, so, you, you start seeing hard angles or bumps in them or it looks like it skips across the skin as you pull the left. That comes through practice, okay? What's another one that distracts focus? When, when the eyeliners don't both start in the inner corner. How often do you see one eyeliner start about here and the other one start way in here? Well, it starts to make the eyes look really different. So what are you doing? You're throwing off the balance. That's why one of the greatest things that um, I can have you guys do is when you finish your makeups, Look at them in the mirror, but then take a picture of them. Take a picture head on, take a picture with your eyes closed, and then I want you to, you know, make sure it's on a quality camera where you can zoom in and still see it nice and clear. I want you to start studying the eyes and make sure everything you did is completely symmetrical and even, almost like you're a makeup forensic anthropologist, that you are studying every bit of this makeup. When you look at things from that direction, it's gonna blow your mind how quickly what you do will transform. That's something I can promise you. Okay, so with that being said, um, let's take a look here at one of what I'd started to mention, some common things and what they do. Now I started to mention those, those eyeliner placements and what they cause. So take a look at this. Now do you see how much the eyes lifted here? Why do they call it a cat eye? This is an interesting thing, right? It should be obvious, but a lot of people don't know it. Why do they call it a cat eye? Because what do cat's eyes do? The inner corner tilts down. So how do you make something a cat eye? To give the illusion that the inner corner tilts down, the outer corner has to be falsely brought up. That's what the cat liner does. So when you do something like this, it doesn't do it. When you do something like this, it doesn't do it. Now, am I saying that these things can't be done? Well, sure they can. If it's what you're trying to create, if it works best in your client's eye, if they have a certain lid that's unwelcoming to a liner, I've never really found anybody who can't when applied appropriately and played with and shifted, have an eyeliner that lifts, right? But it's something that you can always play with, tweak. But do you see how this is actually, I always call this Cleopatra eyeliner. 
You, have you ever seen those Cleopatra makeups and they always have that eyeliner that comes straight out to the side? So many people call that a cat eye, right? It's not. You know, um, look at this one. I call this the fish hook. You know how often you're gonna see it? It fish hooks down and it swoops up. Why do you wanna pull the eyes down before you lift them? Do you see that every one of these is exactly the same eye? And do you see that only one of them really lifts? And do you see that only one of them actually gives the appearance that the inner corner tilts down? Pretty amazing, right? So when you really start to understand directionality and angles, it can change everything that you do. So these upward angles are not only going to, you know, give you that calic appearance, they lift the entire feature. Now what you're going to find really interesting is how everything's going to change when we start talking about these two areas. Everything changed. An extraordinary amount of mistakes are made here and here, particularly given um, how much incorrect information is available on the internet. And I'm not going to throw mud at any of the people who are building you know, their careers through um, being influencers, right? But I will say, having a lot of followers does not mean one is properly trained. Having a lot of followers does not mean one under really understands makeup from a technical point of view. It just means one's got a great personality, has ability, and people like um, like following them, right? So that's that's an important thing. Um, all right, so let's get on to the eyeshadow. When it comes to eyeshadow, one of the most important things that I can say to you here is angles are everything. Now. Do I believe all eyeshadows should be hard lined? You know, people who take tape and lay it down or take credit cards and lay it down? You can do that if you're going for something that's like super editorial and hard lined. But remember, hard lines attract focus. They're gonna attract, same as it defines the upper eye. You're gonna attract focus. But when your eyeshadows get softer on the edges, softer as they transition, they, they drive the focus to the eye instead of pulling it away from it. See how focus and balance are so important? Things that people might not consider. So. You know, if you want to use this, if you're if you're trying to train yourself to make sure everything's perfect, okay, try that. But the better thing, you don't want to be whipping credit cards out when you're working on your clients. You want to be standing there with your brushes. So train yourself to get those skills down. And of course, we do go over them in Master Makeup Artistry, but you understand. But here's the important thing, okay? What do a tremendous number of people do with their eyeshadows? And you're probably already gonna know the answer based on some stuff that I've already, you know, said from eyeliner. Because a lot of these guidelines remain the same. What happens if you take your eyeshadow and you bring it all the way in, filling this area beyond the tear duct, you know, and up onto the side of the nose? An extraordinary number of people do not do it, but it would blow your mind how many do. The first thing that you're doing is you're pulling the eyes closer together. So you have to decide, is that something that I wanted to do? Did I want to pull the eyes closer together? Now, what what's the... For perfect symmetry of face, there, again, it's a science, right? And we're gonna talk a lot about that when we get to the eyebrow too. For perfect symmetry of face, to be one of those things that just draws the attention and makes you go, wow, what's, what's this distance supposed to be? Do you know? It's interesting, right? It's supposed to be the distance of a single eye. The distance of a single eye is supposed to be the space between the eyes. That's perfect symmetry. Interesting, right? Makeup theory, that can serve you really well. So if you have somebody whose eyes are really wide set, what do you do? You bring your eyeshadows in a little bit more, enough so, so that the space between them is the distance of a single eye. Amazing, right? See the science that's behind it? You may or may not have known that. Are you gonna find people with a lot of wide set eyes? No, but you will find them, and now you know exactly what to do. What do you do if somebody's eyes are too close together? Now, that's not a bad thing. We're, like, we're all different, right? We, we, every flower was created and is beautiful in its own way. But to really enhance and give that um, sort of magnetic look to our features, how can we balance them? How can we add that symmetry? So if the eyes are you know, too close together, you do the reverse. You pull your eyeshadows out a little bit more. By smoking them out a little bit more, you pull the eyes out, giving the appearance that this distance is you know, bigger. So all of that sort of starts to stretch, create, shape the face. That's the theory behind placement and shape of the eyes and how to correct if you find that somebody has features that might not completely line up. Like I said, this is advanced stuff, right? It's really advanced stuff. So um, let me take a look here and see where, where I was going um, You know, beyond that. Same thing, with the eyeshadows, I'm gonna show you a diagram, but before I do, it's the next diagram in your booklet. Remember the horizontal line I spoke about? Don't bring your eyeshadow below it. You droop the eye. Don't bring your eyeshadow down here. You droop the eye. Might there be times you want to for the right kind of creation? Depends on what you're trying to do. But do it with thought and reason. Never have it. Now, important thing to think about. 
makeup brushes are very this is always my like it's this is like my teacher's pointer makeup brush i always keep it around in case i have to you know punctuate some point um edge of nostril let me use the thinner end edge of nostril through tear duct that's the ending line the internal ending line makeup application right end of nose corner of eye you see that notice it's not like this when you do it like that well we'll talk about that in a second so it's an upward angle here it is that is exactly what i just showed you right when you fill your eye shadows within this space you're creating balance that agrees with the features so do you see how this creates a beautiful triangle angles shapes on the face attract attention so when you put your colors within here you're completing a triangle that the eyebrows are going to also contribute to so you're creating a shape that works natural with the structures existing on your face it's pretty powerful right there's science behind it now why might not it be great to take and I'm not saying you can't do it but remember very few people look good when their features pull down so why might eyeshadow not look great when it's pulled out here because it doesn't lift most people want their features to lift there might be times you don't but again it should be from thoughtful reason all right so makeup here is never gonna be as flattering as makeup that even slightly goes up you see the difference already see the difference how that lifts my eye the tiniest move lifts my eye and look at this eye versus this one see how much that this eye now looks lifted just from a, a the, you know the the stem of a brush and not from color at all it looks lifted and if I go a little more look at how much more it lifted it there's so much theory and thoughtfulness behind makeup and you see how that can change everything it changes where the eyes go it pulls you up which makes everybody looks younger more al alert more awake so it's a really powerful thing to work on all right now let me see if I've missed anything here um now in the course itself I teach you a technique that I've called the multi-step eye. That's a way that I've named something. And even, you know, now that I've developed that technique, I even have another step that I add to it. The funny thing about the multi-step eye is you can use it in a million different directions. And that's something you learn in the Master Makeup Artistry course. It's all about how to combine um, base shade, lid, highlight, mid-tone, crease, outer corner colors, how you can utilize all those to create the base for billions billions of looks anything that you will ever look at in makeup even if something just created it you're going to realize it's variations of those techniques put together in artful clean crisp ways and when you utilize those you're going to be able to create spectacular new and unique things or things from the past they're the building blocks to every makeup but understanding them from these perspectives transforms exactly how much you're capable of delivering when your clients really look at your makeups right so it's a pretty powerful thing now um like i said there's countless ways to combine these but the placement the angles they're what's going to guarantee that everything you always create is flattering see makeup isn't just about oh my god i'm a makeup artist makeup artist is about flattering your client that's why we even out the skin tone all these discolorations like i'm wearing a tinted primer right now um, my tinted primer neutralizes the darkness on my face, allowing me to put a little bit of blush where I want it, and then the focus is drawn to my eyes. I don't, you know, do anything beyond that except conceal because I got some monstrous dark circles. I'll be completely honest with you. They are monstrous, and it's very rare you guys have seen me without them. But one day, maybe one day I'll do a live, um, I'll do a live video with you guys, and I'll show you how light-handed you can be with makeup to create a perfect face that looks makeupless. So if that's something that interests you, give us a gung-ho in the bottom and we'll make a, um, we'll make a video about that because it's applicable to men and women. Let's talk about the brows. We just did the eyes, right? So we've already looked at how to build focus in the eyes. Want to continue to inf intensify that focus? Here's how. Let's consider the brows. Now, when I start to talk about what I'm going to call the classic brow, please know, like you see here, you're saying that you use tape when you put on eyeshadow. The very interesting thing that I said just a few minutes ago is, do you really want to be putting tape on people's skin? No, no. I'm going to tell you something. It's very unprofessional. If that's something you want to do to yourself, do it. But if you're sticking tape on a client's skin and then yanking it, it's extremely unprofessional. Don't do it. It's a YouTube Instagram thing. Don't do it, right? So what I want you to do is I want you to um, 
practice so that you can get these angles yourself. But remember what I said? But if you put that tape down, you're going to have a hard line at the outer edge. A hard line is not going to be particularly flattering because it's going to distract focus. What's a hard line doing out there? It doesn't pull focus into the eye. Like, let's think about it if you were an actor. You know those people you say, oh, they've got stage presence. Well, why don't we give your makeup stage presence? Why don't we make it the thing that people can't look away from? Not because it's aggressive and clownish, but because it has such power right that's the power of it that's the awesome thing so we've already been talking about placement right and how there are so many different ways that you can combine all the techniques of master makeup artistry through the multi-step eye right to create unlimited looks and yes sometimes for editorial for a particular client you may want to pull things somewhere else I haven't yet found anybody I've wanted to do that on, but there are certain times that you want to create things. But remember, always do everything you do from a place of thoughtfulness, from consideration, okay? That's super powerful. So um, we've talked about the placement. We've talked about why it's so important, right? And remember, everything I'm talking to you about, they're not rules. Everything in makeup is about a guideline. It's, a, it's about a guideline. Now, you know, you, there's an interesting comment here. Put a video up on the eyebrow. Many people don't understand, and I'm one of them. Guess what's coming? We're going to be doing eyebrows in a minute, and it's serious. So your, your prayers are about to be answered, my love. All right, so the very next thing I want to talk about is what I call, and this is something you're probably not going to see in many places out there in the industry, but I call it the 25 to 30% guideline, okay? And I'm going to show you an image that really starts to illustrate it, all right? Um, and then after that, we're going to go into back into the eyebrows and the classic shape of eyebrows, okay? But um, what, what I'm talking about here is the 25 to 30% variation. Now, a lot of people, and, and a lot of this started with the Olsen twins and how much darkness they were pulling below the eyes. Remember, you can do anything, but you have to know what things do and why directionality and angle is so important, okay? So take a look at this. This is the 25 to 30% guideline. You know how many people love smoke in the shadow out below? Now, if the concentrated darkness in the lower part of the eye is any more than 25 to 30% of what's on the top, you're gonna pull the eyes down. See how you're pulling this eye down? Again, I'm not saying you can't do it, but I'm saying have thought and reason behind when and why you do, okay? Now, there is a lot of eyeliner up here. I've drawn the eyeliner on, but notice because there's like 60% on the bottom, you are yanked down. Notice there's lots of eyeliner down here, but because it's only 25 to 30% of what's on the bottom, do you see that these are two different eyes? And do you see how one, I mean, they're exactly the same eye, but look at how dramatically one of them lifts and how dramatically the other gets pulled down. See the thought, reason, and theory behind makeup application? And it's something you won't really consider. In this day and age, you know, Kieran Knightley does it all the time. It's all about the smoked out lower lash line. I'm not saying you can't do it, but you know how many people just do it habitually now and pull people's eyes down? Do you think that this will be flattering on somebody who has super dark circles? No. Do you think that this is gonna be flattering on somebody who has lots of lines, wrinkles, crepiness, and might have sagging skin? No. You have to know the theories behind Behind your makeup because it all really matters now what I had started to say about the eyebrows is that oh and by the way that's great know the rules and then break them but what I always say about makeup is um, I and this is so I always say know the guidelines and then break them but it's exactly the same thing so that's why I call that's why I don't call it the 25 to 30 percent rule I call it the 25 to 30 percent guideline because then it just says okay good idea right so um, interesting right when you see these things side by side how much they can change stuff so the, the classic eyebrow the classic eyebrow really has its birth in the 1950s you know go back and look at the 50s those classic eyebrows the shape but the one thing I'll tell you is it's timeless it works on everybody does that mean there aren't variations of the eyebrow of course there are and we're gonna look at some of them but before we do the very first thing I want to talk to you about is the classic one when you understand the classic eyebrow the interesting thing that you're gonna well actually before I talk to you about the classic eyebrow the reason I want to tell you that the eyebrow as a feature is incredibly important is because if you do the wrong eyebrow on people you can change their expression like if you bring this inner part of the eyebrow down a little bit too far, do you see how I just made myself angry? You see it, right? You know how many people do that? If I bring the eyebrows in too far, I'll use my own to show you. Do you see how I just made myself quizzical? 
the shape of the eye, like if I do, if, if I make them flat, do you see how I just took all expression and shape from my face? You can, I'm trying to get rid of my arch. I'm not trying to, you know, make uh, offensive, you know, facial features, um, impersonations. I'm just trying to get rid, see how I've changed my feature. You've got to be careful because you can completely transform expression by doing the wrong eyebrow. So that's why it's so important. So the most important thing that I'll say is eyebrows are sisters, not twins. Our goal isn't to make them exact because the two sides of the face often are not exact. Our goal instead is to make them as similar as possible to balance and add symmetry to the face. It's all about the balance, right? The wrong eyebrows can pull your features down or they can lift your features up. There's great things that they can do when you really understand what's behind them. So like I said, the classic eyebrow comes from the 1950s, um, and, but it's timeless today and it works on just about everybody. But what you have to do is you have to look at your client's individual features to see exactly what variation is best for them, but you also have to listen to their taste. That combination of things will, it will take you in the right direction. But when you understand the classic eyebrow, if you vary the thickness, if you vary the placement of the arch, if you vary the angle of it, you can turn it into a million different variations of eyebrow. And Carlos, you're absolutely right. I consider my, I always say to people, makeup, you're, you can be a makeup alchemist. You can be a mad scientist when you really understand makeup. That's why it's so important to understand theory and to also, and guys, this, this webinar might run a little longer because there's so much in it. Um, but um, and, I'll, and we'll see if if um, if um, if Karina tells me that she thinks that we should cut off in one place, we can always pick up in the second place with the with the other parts of it. But I'll wait and see. Um, okay. So one of the other um, things that's so important to, to remember here is that the eyebrows are the upper frame for the eyes. Remember, this is one of your main focal points. So is this. But this is the predominant focal point, right? These create the upper frame for it. Notice how funny things get when these are gone, right? Things get really funny. Notice how immediately there's a frame for the eyes. Now, if your frame is too dramatic, think about when you go to the museum. Have you ever been at a museum and um, have, have seen that the, um, the frame is so maybe ornate and wild that you're not really looking so much at the picture, the portrait, which is the eyes, because you're staring at the frame. Those aggressive eyebrows that so many people do on Instagram and YouTube, they are pulling your focus up. That's one of the big problems. So you just want you want to remember it's about balance. That's why I always say to people, use a color that's one to shoot two shades lighter than the brow and use gentle hair like strokes. We teach that perfectly in the video, in the Master Makeup Artistry course, right? But if you start doing those ombre, super light, gets dark and overdrawn, what are you doing? You're pulling focus. You always got to remember, where do I want people to be looking? I've said this to you guys before. Nobody ever said the eyebrows are the window to the soul, right? Nobody ever said that. Eyebrows don't communicate. They add to the communication, but these are the communicator. This is the communicator. Know your focus. Know why you're doing what you're doing. It's super powerful, okay? So when we start to consider that, and you know, contrary to what Instagram and YouTube might think, let's take a look at um, my little eyebrow chart. And this is one, guys. Remember, if you don't have the chart, don't worry. It can be emailed to you. It's better right now to look and listen because you can study it later, okay? So here we go. Let's look at what makes a perfect eyebrow. So. I'm going to lean in here. You're not going to see me for a minute because I want to I want to show you guys this stuff. The way that you're going to start to determine your eyebrow is you're going to start to look at placement, shape, and size. So it really does all come down to science. The way that you're going to figure out exactly how high above the eye the eyebrow should be is with the, with the height of an eye. So if you look at the height of your eye, notice it's called D, D, D. The height of the eye goes from here to here. It's the same distance from here to here and from here to here. Now, everybody's different. Everybody's faces are, you know, need adjustment, which is why I said you can always start to play with where you place it on each person's individual features. But the very important thing is knowing, knowing the science behind it. Now, let's look at our second placement. Where do we, where do we know how to put the arch, the peak of the arch? You go from the tear duct to the edge of the iris. When the, when the person's looking forward, that's exactly where the arch falls. Where does the eyebrow end? Where does the tail end? The exact same distance that's here 
is this distance here. See the symmetry of the eyebrow? You see how it all adds up to perfection and precision on the face? Now, everybody's different. Some people will have lower set eyebrows. You're not gonna pull their eyebrow off and put it in the right place, but it just, it, it shows you how to work with their features and where you put the right strokes to lift, to open. So let's say, like, look at, notice I have a lower eyebrow. Most men do. Men have heavier brows than women because their foreheads are heavier. It makes them look more masculine. Most men have heavier brows. So notice that I have, had, imagine if I had a higher brow. If I was, you know, if I was a woman, my eyebrow very well may be here. Do you see how much that just changed my face? It made it softer and more feminine. Isn't that interesting? See how much placement changes things? Now let's change where my arch is. Notice now I've put my arch out here. Do you see how I've made myself look a little sinister? Notice that I've just done that thing that so many people are doing on YouTube right now and I've made my eyebrow flat. See how much more flattering it is over here? Now look at the difference if it were the, 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 the sort of classic woman's eyebrow. Notice if I put the arch a little too high in, how things look a little strange. The placement has everything to do with how uniform features look. A quick guide, it's a little bit different and it puts things in a little bit different of a place, but if you're looking at someone and you're like, well, how do I figure this out on a face? I can't put a grid out. Here's an example. Look at that. See where my eyebrow begins? Look at that. See where the arch is? Notice I'm going right through the pupil and the end of the iris. Take a look here. Look at the corner of my eye. Look where my eyebrow ends. Most men's eyebrows go a little bit further as well. It's a, it's a masculine thing, right? But do you see how that my eyebrow, despite not having the space, follows the shape? So do you see how they frame my eyes? They pull you into the eye? Isn't it interesting? The theory works even though we all have different features. So it's a really important thing to look at and understand. Now let's go a little bit deeper into it, okay? So when we talk about the arch peak, take a look at this one. Do you see that now I've broken the, the top one? All these are the same, but do you see how I've broken the top one into halves? When you break the top one into halves, you see exactly where the arch peak should be. You see, it begins at the 50% point of the upper D and ends at the top point of it. Interesting, right? Doesn't mean you can't be a little out from it. You probably don't want to be a little in from it because it'll start to look a little funny. It'll start to... Um, what it'll start to do is give you that. Have you ever seen that eyebrow that almost looks like a, quota uh, uh, a quotation mark or a comma? So if you bring it in too far, you're going to get that comma eyebrow, which is one that you really want to usually fix and adjust. Okay, and where the eyebrow ends, if you end it up here, you're gonna notice it's not gonna have the same symmetry. You wanna bring it down here and then it will have all that symmetry and balance. But it all comes down to the science of the addition of it. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go in with it just so you guys can look at it. See the precision and symmetry of that? Now, one of the things that I said is that you can transition this and make this shape different. Now, this doesn't have the whole graph in it because the eye isn't here, but take a look. Do you see how these, now here's a natural eyebrow, right? So the natural eyebrow means it's a little bit fuller. It's a lot of what you're seeing. Like um, I have a natural eyebrow. It's my, it's my natural shape, right? I trim a little of these because mine like kind of grow up in a caveman way, but I don't have to trim this side. I only have to trim this side for balance, right? But you see that my eyebrows are sisters, not twins. They're not exactly the same. Nobody's are. Well, some, someone's probably somewhere on earth is. Now see, this is what is the thinner eyebrow that some people have and better suits their features. This is the classic eyebrow that we were just looking at, right? But notice in this, it's slightly varied. We slightly varied it to show you that there are so many versions, variations, and slight changes that you can make to things. So I'm not saying that you have to make everybody's eyebrow exactly the same. No, that's quite contrary to what I'm telling you. I'm just telling you that when you follow these, do you see that despite the slight variances in these, these all have slight variations in them, but do you see how they all still honor the shape? Interesting, right? Theory, science, it all works on different people when you really start to consider their features and how things will work and add up, right? So the big thing to remember is there is science behind it, but remember, science has to be customized to your individual client. That's where we start combining our theory and our thoughtfulness with exactly how we work our artistry. Pretty powerful, right? Um, I see a lot of people are having to sign off. No worries, you can always tune in. Um, you know, look at your minute point. Tune in at the end of this later. But I'm gonna get into the the, the cheeks, the lips. But we're we're getting we're getting close to wrapping up. So one of the things about that's important to remember is the power of the brow. Unless you do it improperly, remember I said brows can shut down, close off. The power of the brow is to lift the features and to frame the eye. The last thing you want to do is pull the eyes down. Like how many women want to look like this? 
And if you do a brow that's too aggressive or too bottom heavy, that's what you do. If you do a brow that's way too top heavy, you do this. How many people want to look like that? Not many. It's the balance. It's the evenness. It's the consideration of the science behind it, okay? So when you create the proper frame, now, notice I'm only talking about one side of the frame. Do you guys know what the other half of the frame is? And some people will know this and some won't, and it's a kind of tricky thing. The second half of the frame is the cheekbone. Second half of the frame is the cheekbone. This bone is called the zygomatic arch. Okay, it's called the zygomatic arch. If you put your fingers on the cheekbone, it's something I'm gonna do right here. The cheekbone is rounded. It's, it, it, it's the, the, the sort of peak of it is right here, and then it rounds upward up here, and it rounds down in here. And you know, because see how your fingers sink right into it? You can kind of go right into and kind of feel the upper part of it, like your teeth down here. That's where you know that it is right there, okay? So when you're applying your blush um, properly, what's gonna happen is you're creating the lower frame to the upper frame, driving focus to the eye. Isn't it kind of genius? Once all this starts coming together, you start seeing how all these bits, and because then look at this. We've got this here, which all sits inside. Remember the lines of the eye makeup? And it all sits inside this circle, this twining circle you have going around the eye, creating those eyes that just suck you in. It's kind of genius, isn't it? I, like this stuff, it really, it really gets me going because it's how you really can have wicked control over your makeup. And I'm gonna tell you something, guys. You who are watching this are gonna be way ahead of your competition because I guarantee you a lot of people just don't think like this. It's boom, it's an explosion, right? So it's, um, it's a, well, thank you, Amy. You made my day. Yo, you're such a flirt. All right. So with that in mind and talking about um, the cheeks, I'm going to talk about this cheek. And for those of you that already got my handouts, you're probably going to have noticed that my cheek handout looks a little weird, right? My cheek handout looks a little weird, but I'll explain it. Here's the thing about the cheeks. There's lots of ways to do cheeks. And depending on what you're trying to create, there's all different ways, directions, and reasons you can create it. Guys, my daughter's coming over to say hi. So I'm going to let her say hi. Here she is. This is my daughter. Hi, she's been with me two months. We're in love. Mm. And I think she has to go wee, so she's ready to go. Go wee, my love, go wee. Oh, no, she just wanted to give me a kiss on my leg. So that's my daughter, guys. She likes to get involved in things, and she's very precious and sweet and loving. Um, okay, so with that in mind, let's talk about the cheeks. So here we are with the cheeks, okay? Um, notice when we take a peek at this, see how I'm on the rounded cylinder of the cheek? See how I'm right here? I'm on the rounded cylinder of the cheek. Notice I'm not up here. Here's the important thing that I wanna tell you guys about. And this is a rule, it's, uh, it's a guideline, but it's a really powerful one. What do dark colors do? Dark colors draw things back make them look smaller. What do bright colors do? Or colors that have luminosity, catch the light, they draw areas forward, right? So how can we use that to our advantage? Well, when you start using the steps of the multi-step eye and use light shades, dark shades, light shades, you further um, put together all of that focus in the area that the cheek is gonna tie into, right? So now the reason I'm talking about darks and lights here, if you put a darker color up here on the highest part of your cheekbone, do you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna take these beautiful high cheekbones and you're gonna make them look smaller. You're gonna flatten the face. Why? Because blush, although pink, is darker than our skin. And if you're darker skin toned, garnet is darker than your skin. So you're gonna make your cheeks look smaller. That's why highlight goes on the highest part. What does that do? It essentially does this. Put highlight on the highest part and it does that. That's what we want to happen, right? So see, here's the rounded part. On this lower rounded part, see the highlight's gonna go up here. On this lower rounded part, you're gonna put your blush. Rule, guideline of thumb. If you bring it down too far, you pull the face down. Never looks good. Never go beyond, if you're just doing the blush on the outer corner, um, the normal blush, you know, blush. Don't, that's to warm the face, to add attention, to pull everything together. Don't go beyond the corner of the eye. If you start going, bringing it and going down here, you yank it down. Never go below the nostrils. Because if you go in beyond the corner of the eye, below the nostrils, see more angles, you pull the features down, all right? If you go too low, you can make the face look really puffy and long, really long in an unflattering way. Those are some incredible um, mistakes that are made. Bobby, if you're having trouble with the audio, don't worry, this is gonna be on our page. You can watch it anytime you want. You can watch it again and again and again if you want. So 
With that being said, here's the second thing, guys. One of the ways that I love to do blush is I call it the Nike swoosh. This is my own technique. You come down on the lower rounded part of the cheekbone and you swoop up onto the apple. Um, and I'm gonna give you another guideline, and this one I'll tell you, trust me on this one. Um, when you swoop up like the Nike swoosh, it lifts the features up, and you know what it does? It ends up mirroring the eye. Isn't that awesome? So you've got this shape up here, you have this shape here, so what are you doing? Do you see what I mean? And then when you've got all this darkness, brightness, highlighting, you start to circle all of the color in. It's amazing. So you're almost creating, you know when, um, in the like whatever, if, if there's a whirlpool in the Bermuda Triangle that just sucks people in, it's like here we've got the outer edge of that Bermuda Triangle, and then here we've got that really tight part where the ship is going down and down and down, and it's never coming back. You're doing that with your makeup. You're pulling people in, right? It's all science. It all does that. But did you ever realize that, you're, that, that if you've got the right lift to your eyebrow and you end it in the right place, do you know what it does? It lifts your cheek. Why? Because your cheek is the lower frame. So, you know, when eyebrows stop too short, notice when I take that part of my eyebrow off, my cheek did, doesn't look as prominent. Interesting, right? The eyebrows back, look how prominent my cheek looks. That's why shape is so important. That's why these lines that we're talking about are so important. Now, when you combine that with the cheek, which in its own way is an invisible frame, even when you put the blush on, it's never going to be as dramatic as the eyebrow, but that doesn't matter. Because what happens is, even here, like, what, what is the, um, the theory of, uh, you know, an, an, an object in action, you know, um, equal, you know, remains in action. So let's look at this. We've created action. It's going to remain in action. You get pulled back up to it. Even though your color stopped here, you get pulled back up to it. But if you do the Nike swish, you supercharge people up. So you really direct the focus up, lifting the features, right? But if you do the Nike swish, do not go beyond the inner edge of the iris or the pupil because if you bring it all the way to the nose, you can make the nose look red. And now see this, this is called the nasolabial fold. Some people call them the monkey lines, the marionette lines. There's a lot of different names that people have for them. Um, the more we age, the more we have them. You can see, unfortunately, I have them. Um, but if you bring the blush all the way down, it's almost the equivalent of coloring in, you know, you know when you're kids and you, you color within the lines in those pre-made coloring books? If you color all of that pink, Number one, you brought it too low, so you're pulling the features down. But number two, because you put a color right above this, you make the lines look deeper. So that's why it's so important to always consider placement and line, evenness, shape, where we're directing things, right? So that's one of the things that I want to tell you. I've already told you what happens if you bring them too high, you make the features look low. You bring them too low, you pull the face down. If you put too much color on the cheeks, what do you do? Same thing that happens if you put too much color in the eyebrow. You distract from the eyes. You never want to stare at the frame. You always want to stare at the art. Remember that. Like, think about, we are, we're humans. We're a work of art. We're each one of us individual and special in our own way, and it's an important thing to remember, right? So, um, too much color can make it, and also, when you use too much color, it's that old, you know, they look rouged. You want to, you might want to do that for a certain period kind of thing, if you're doing a period piece or something that's set in a particular area, or you're doing the right editorial or runway look, but you don't want to make a habit, make it a habit in your everyday makeup application. I talked to you about the Nike stroke, um, the mirroring the brow, and um, I've talked to you about the power of the errors. So let's go on to the final part, my darlings, and then I'm going to um, go over a few things and we're going to talk, um, we'll, we'll answer your questions. The final thing that I want to talk about is the lips, okay? The interesting thing about um, the lips is there's a mistake. And I think it'll blow your mind. If you guys start looking at your own, the makeups you do on yourselves and the makeup you do on other people, I think you guys will be amazed at how many of you do this. And it's, I'm not insulting you. I'm like, I'm just going to remind you of that thing that I said at the beginning, okay? If you do not think about your lines and change the way you view makeup, you are going to fall into that trap of doing things by habit and not noticing. So the greatest gift that I can give you is getting to you to look at your makeup in a different way. And that's a big part of what we're gonna handle today, okay? So what do lips do? Lips maintain balance and proportion, lip liner. Lip liner maintains balance and proportion in the lips, okay? It frames and defines the lips the same way eyeliner frames and defines the eyes. Because like, look at, look at lips. They naturally fade into the skin. You can keep a lip simple, you know, if you're trying to do the, um, the original image that I showed you guys, and you're trying to make sure that the main focal point is the eyes. Well, yeah, you can keep the lips super soft. But if you're trying to do anything that is either this 
or this. You can't have that soft line. You have to have that definition of line to really sort of create and enhance. So what that'll do, I want you guys to look at something. Let me see if I, God, I got all excited and I lost my little pointer. So I'm gonna have to use my finger. Do you see here, just above my lip, there's a little light line. It's called the labial roll. You know, I know I'm teaching you guys a lot of professional terms, but these are terms you should know as a pro in the industry, right? Zygomatic arch, nasolabial fold, labial roll. It's the little light ridge outside the lip. Some people have them and they're really defined. Some people have them and they're really light. And we're gonna talk about them because they become very important with the focus of the lip, the shape of the face, and completing the whole look, right? It's an important and often overlooked thing. But in some people's cases, when they put that gl electric glow on the lip, they overdo it. So it's a balance, right? Because you never want people staring here. You either want them looking here, 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 right? So it's it's all the balance. It's all what with, with what we do. So when you um when you choose your lip liner shade, if you choose a light colored lip liner if you choose a light colored lip you know um katie that's an excellent question she katie asks how can you make the lips look a little bigger without overlining the reason i'm going to answer that right now in the middle is because it all has to do with that labial roll if you want to make the lips look bigger without overlining all you've got to do is go the slightest bit onto that labial roll and it won't look your lips will look bigger and it's a great thing to do. You know how some people have really big um, lower lips? I'm not going to say really big, but compared to their upper lip, you know some people, let me do it. So some, I can't, I'm trying. But you know some, you, some people's upper lips are really small and the, uh, the lower lip might be much fuller. If you go on the labial roll or even slightly above it, you balance the shape of the two lips, making them look even to the features. But the labial roll, if you do, if you do want to make your lips a little bit bigger, you go on the labial roll, and you outline the entire lip evenly and symmetrically. And we're gonna talk about that in a second because that's the trap. That's where people make the mistake, okay? And then if you take away this lightness, you have to return it because the, the, the features will look flat. We all have this labial roll, right? So if you take it away and don't put it back, the, the mouth will look flat. Okay, so what you want to do is, and I don't recommend you get your Mary, Mary Lou Manizer is one of my favorite highlighters, and it just makes things go, but it's got to be used light handed, right? I recommend you get your foundation that's one shade, two shades lighter than the skin, and gently put it around the lip, and then take your brush and just give it a little pull, and you will, you will see right away, dimension will come back to the lips, a soft pucker will return to them, all naturally, all on its own. It's a pretty smart thing, and it's the best way to highlight the lips and not overdo it the way Instagram and YouTube is teaching you to. One of the things I always tell people, and what you're learning probably in this theory section, is how I always say to people, everything in makeup, even the things you see on Instagram and YouTube, even the most wild and out there things, even the naturalist of the natural, it's all based on classic technique. So see when people do this electric stuff on the, on, on the Cupid's bow, you see how it's based on classic technique, it just went a little too far. And does that mean it can't pop up in the right photograph or in the right runway show? Of course. Am I saying it's a no-no? No. But am I saying maybe you shouldn't walk down the street with it? Because in photographs, you can control the light. You know you're turning it into art. In real life, it can start to look sweaty or weird or just distract focus. You've got to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, Lola, Lola, Lola Ladybug, my darling. Do you have to use primer on the lips? No. It depends on the person's lips. Depends on the, the read that you're trying to get in color. I, um, I probably almost never used lip primer to be completely honest with you, because what I'll often usually do is I will just use my liner and I'll completely color in the lips. It tends to do what I need to do. But everybody's different about products, so if it's something you love, it's something you can definitely use, okay? So um, if you use darker colored lip liner, you're gonna add de definition and depth to the lips. It's also going to, if it's darker than the lipstick, create a natural pucker because it'll pull the center of the mouth forward. I don't recommend, unless you're going for this specific look, to just line it. You wanna shade it in, right? And then you get a natural pucker. If you use lighter lip liners, all they do is really add the definition evenness and balance to your lip. Amy, do I need do you absolutely need to use lip liner? Depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying if you're well, if you have anybody who has well, lip liner does several things. Lip liner creates a nice line that actually works like a dam and doesn't let your lipstick bleed. 
So if you've got a client whose lipstick bleeds or anyone else whose lipstick, and um, Gail, yeah, it's common sense, isn't it? It is, right? But isn't it amazing how so many people don't think of these things or you'll know them and you'll be like, oh my God, of course I should have known that. Or some of you are already doing it. I say awesome to all of that, right? Um, so what you're gonna, um, and someone said they have big lips. How do you make them look more balanced? Well, you just, you bring the, the lipstick a little, uh, just you make sure you're right on the inner part of the lip line. Don't go out at all on the labial fold, right? On the inner part of the lip line. So, um, God, see, I told you I had a goldfish brain. I forgot what I was just saying. Um, God, I forgot what I was just saying. So I guess it wasn't important. I guess it was a lie. Um, so if, if I remember what I'm saying, I'll go back to it. And if I don't, um, I won't. oh, so... Um, lip liner balances the proportion of the lips. Oh, do you always need to use lip liner? It depends on what you're trying to do. Lip liner is a great way to create dimension. Lip liner, when it fills completely in the lips, is a great way to make sure that bride's lipstick doesn't wear off through the wedding because, number one, it creates a great base, but secondly, if the lipstick does wear away, you still have the lip liner, so it won't look like the lipstick wear away, which is super powerful, right? So um, last but certainly not least as we get into this, you want to balance the size of the lips. So if you notice that the lips are off, you just you can line the, the labial fold of one but not the other, okay? Um, and additionally, um, you can cr start to create shape and dimension by how you color them. But here's the interesting thing that I want to really talk about, okay? What are some of the biggest mistakes that people make? And it's a mistake that people always, always, always always make okay especially when they're working on themselves because when you've got your dominant hand one side is easier than the other so on this on the opposite side of your face you tend to do the correct one on the on, on your dominant side you tend to do it incorrect here's what people do all right I want you to look at this so this is the proper symmetrical lip liner. Do you see how it's completely even on the two sides? The cupid's bow is the same height, the outer corners are the same, the lower lips the same. Now it might be hard to see here, but do you see how on this side, the cupid's bow goes higher and it's rounded out, giving the full lip. And on the lower lip, you're on the outer labial fold. And then when you get to the middle, on this side, people switch to the inner labial fold. You're going to look at your makeups and you're going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm guilty. Not all of you, but I guarantee some of you will. And then on this side, you end up doing a straight line down, a straight hard line down. And often on this side, you won't go all the way out to the corner of the lip because you create that hard line. And on this side, you have a rounded line. But guess what? People don't just do it on themselves. They also do it on their clients. So that's one of the big things that people need to adjust and correct. You have to make sure those are even and symmetrical. And the reason I created this chart is it will blow your mind how many people do that. And it'll blow your mind when you start watching videos, when you start looking at makeup applications, when you start looking at, like look at your, and I don't mean this in a bad way and never leave negative comments for people unless people are asking for advice and leave it in a thoughtful way. But if you are connected to other makeup students, Start looking at their work and just notice how many people do this very thing that I'm talking about. Or who, they'll do one rounded Cupid's bow and one pointed one. Those things always have to be balanced, okay? It re, you know, and I'm seeing some people mention, oh my God, I do this, I do this. Of course, a lot of us do it. I used to do it. Um, but noticing that and fixing it is an incredibly powerful thing, right? S uh, symmetrical lips are imperative for a balanced face. Because remember, e if we're trying to make this a focal point, you know, if you make a mistake in a nude lipstick, no one's going to notice it. If you make a mistake in a red or a burgundy, everyone's going to see it. So, you know, that, those are the important things to remember. And um, the full balance face adds all this up. So, you know, I hope you've learned a lot from what I'm talking about in these angles and corrections. And as much as, you know, some of you might be excited about it and much as some of you might dread it, makeup is science. You know, there's, there's some science in math in just about everything. And when you understand these angles, you can use them to your favor. But the joy is I'm never going to make you do a theorem. I'm never going to make you start playing with, oh my God, calculus. I'm only going to want you to start thinking about things from a direction and how they flatter. And what's one of the greatest ways that you can balance this? To practice it on your own. Try what, see what happens, guys. Next time you do your makeup on yourself, in a time when you're not going out or if, if you're happy to make the correction, see what happens when you bring your eyeshadow down or your eyeliner out and then take it off and angle it up. See what happens. Trying things on yourself and seeing how much more flattering it is will transform what you do to your clients. Even if you're a boy and you don't do makeup on yourself, I, you know, I don't, I've practiced eyeliners on myself, not because I wear them out, but because I want to learn more, right? Um, it is a different thing doing it on yourself than doing it on someone else, but when you see the power of these angles, it'll blow your mind. It'll blow your mind. 
All right, so let me remind you guys about the webinar special, okay? So if you're a new student, you have lower lower um, starting fee, lower monthly payments. It's $89 to start and lower payments. You get the whole kit and you get all the awesome um, 35th anniversary additional items. So that includes all kinds of things, lashes, eyelash applicator, beauty sponges, tons of makeup, right? And those of you that are existing students, it's 50% off and you get those tons of bonus items no matter what course you sign up for, okay? And my recommendation if you're considering courses is Master make skincare and master makeup artistry, either together or skincare first, or you can always do skincare later, but you have to understand skin if you want to be a great makeup artist. Remember, science, science, science. And um, follow that by Pro Makeup Workshop Global Beauty. And then you can accent your career later with things like airbrush, Pro Makeup Workshop, etc., etc. So um, this is going to be an absolutely awesome um, time for me to dive into questions. And um, we'll do that. And then um, after the questions, um, I'm just gonna tell you guys how much I love you and how glad that I am that you're here and how glad I am that you're so passionate about makeup and bringing your best to all the people around you. Okay, so Tori, what is my go-to brand which is affordable and worldwide? You only say, um, I only say that as I know the makeup over there we don't have half of down here. Okay, Australia. So what is my go-to brand that's affordable and worldwide? Um, well, a lot of my foundation, the, a lot of the, the primers that I use are Cover FX. They're, um, I you know I don't know how they work. Uh, you know, everybody's currency is is a little bit different, but they're they're forty five dollars here. Um, but I'll tell you, each one lasts a really long time. Like they last a re, you only need the tiniest bit. They last forever. Um, those are the ones I use. My my foundations are also Cover FX. They last a really long time. But you know how many um so many people love. Tarte is awesome. I'm, I'm confident you have Tarte. Um, Giorgio Armani's foundations are wonderful. Bobbi Brown. People love Bobbi Brown's. NARS, Makeup Forever. But they, they can graduate in price. But here's the thing that you have to understand. They last a really long time. You do not need much. They last a really long time. All right? Um, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't recommend that when it comes to eyeshadows, when it comes to foundations, when it comes to setting powders, I don't recommend drugstore brands. I don't because they have drying agents in them or they're loaded with talc. So you have lay, way less control over exactly where the makeup's going to go. You know what I mean and what it's going to do. So I don't recommend those. But that, but I, I, all the time I tell people, don't be afraid of drugstore lipsticks. They're wax in color. You know, they're, they're great. Don't be afraid of drugstore eyeliners. There's lots of drugstore eyeliners I love. Don't be afraid of drugstore um, mascaras. My favorite mascara is L'Oreal's Voluminous. You know, so don't be afraid to balance your kit with those, but you're gonna find the pigment and eyeshadows for drugstore is nowhere near as pigment rich as those of the pro brands, you know? So I recommend that you invest in the pro brands, but the good news is that, yeah, they're more expensive, but guess what? They last way longer. They do what you're hoping for. I have eyeshadows. Remember, powders don't go bad if you care for them, right? They don't go bad. I have eyeshadows that I've had for 20 years, and I use them all the time. Use them all the time. Um, Stevie, I don't know what the brand ColourPop is, but the important thing that I can say to you guys is, don't be afraid to experiment. Any, if you find a brand that you love, that's the brand for you. Because every one of our hands is different. So, you know, never never fall into, you know, the trap of going, oh my God, someone said they love this, I have to have it. Don't buy anything that I recommend to you. What I want you to do instead is go and try it. That's what I want you to do. I want you to try it. Um, you, you do get a Mac discount um, being one of our students. Um, QC can tell you all about that. Um, you get a lot of discounts actually. Um, tremendous number of companies recognize us as a leading school and you get, you get the, the professional recognition through an extraordinary number of schools. Another brand that I love is Cover FX. Uh, pardon me, three custom color specialists. And they will ship everywhere. Um, their concealer palette, their pro palette, it's this big. You only need the tiniest scrape of it, but you can. There's so much you can do with it. You can highlight. You can contour. You can do so many things. And in a in a bind, it it could be all. You know, pull that out. And you could do highlight, contour, foundation on a full face. It's It's an amazing product. It's not super expensive either. Um, but that that's my advice. Okay, now let me see here. Got to scroll back a little bit. Um, Sandra, um, the best eyeliner for a hooded eye. You find it tricky to fiddle with. Um, if you're talking about the best eyeliner technique, it depends on how hooded it is. If it's one of those eye, you know, when, when, if, the, if the skin goes completely down and the eye's completely hidden, what some people do, believe it or not, is they take the eyeliner and they fill in that entire lid area and then 
no matter what, you'll always have a crisp, tight line right along the lash line. And even if the eye changes a little, you'll always have the line of liner. It's something that people actually do, right? Which is a really interesting thing. Um, and But with hooded eyes, what you want to do is you need the lift, right? What you never want to happen with a hooded eye is liners that go straight out to the side, liners that go down. I want you to start to look at people's cat eyes and notice how often people's cat eyes angle down. Well, guess what? When the eyes was closed, it was angling up, but when they opened the eye, look where it went. I'm not moving my finger. My finger, like I'm pressing it into my skin, see? So right now it looks, um, hang on, I'm gonna do it like this. It looks like I'm angled up, right? But I opened the eye and look where it went. It's straight out to the side. I haven't moved my finger. So what you know, need to do is then say, okay, I gotta change those angles a little bit. It's a lot sharper than you thought it needed to be, isn't it? So you want that upward lift. Now, what can often work, not everybody wants a cat eye, right? But you know how powerful a wing is? Take your wedge, build your wedge, and then give it the tiniest flick. The tiniest flick lifts and opens those eyes. It's a powerful thing. That's my advice for the hooded eye. All right, but any of them work. It depends on what you're trying to create. All right, Tracy, what's the best way to keep shine from happening under the eyes and on the cheeks? Great question. Um, the first thing I'd say to you is the QC Skin Course will be invaluable to you for that. Invaluable, right? So um, regarding shine below the eyes, the eyes are one of the hottest areas of the face. And right here is one of the only places on the face where skin is against skin. Because see, the nose sticks out. That's why we get a lot of oil there. There's heat, heat creating oil. And the eye is just so hot because the eye never goes to sleep. So it's always generating heat. So um, these areas can start to collect a lot of oil, sweat, right? Oily eyelids, it's primer. You need primer and you need a great primer and you need to make sure that your layers are sheer. Sometimes people put a really thick primer and it really starts to melt, which you never want to happen. Um, but shine below the eyes. Don't be afraid. There's a lot of companies and my favorite one's by Cover FX and it's really cheap, okay? It's a mattifying powder. That's what its whole purpose is. If Because you, you, often you don't shine right away. You shine a little while later. You pull out your mattifying powder and you, and you tap it in. It resets the makeup. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I like it more than I like blotting pet papers. I love it. And it, mine it lasts forever because you use so little of it. You just you tap it right into the area. It's super easy. And it will neutralize that shine. It'll be perfect. But that's my advice to you. Um, all right. Uh, let's take a look here at the next one. Um, all right. Um, oh, 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 also one other thing. So if you use the right, there's like my favorite um, setting spray is Scandinavia. If you use the setting spray by Scandinavia, there is one that's specifically for sweat control. It's amazing. They're not expensive. The company's called Scandinavia. I love it. All right. Um, Tracy, um, second question. I know um, to many people that use super dark eyeliner and much lighter lipstick, um, you know, too many people that use um, super dark eyeliner and much lighter lipstick, what's a good balance and what is the best way to tell them to lighten up on the liner? Well, it depends on what they want to do. Um, like, remember, if people are using light lipstick and dark on the eyes, aren't they, aren't they doing, where is it? Where is it? Yeah, figures. I set these all aside. Aren't they doing, oh crud, that's not it. Aren't they doing this? There's nothing wrong with that. But, um, oh, oh, lip liner. I see what you mean. They're using lip liner and, well, guess what? That's kind of dated. There's places that get stuck with that, but it's kind of a dated thing. And there are times you might want to do it for the right editorial and this and that, but it's a balance. What I would say to people is, you know, um, what, what I'd say to people is, uh, you want to create a lot of dimension in your lip. What, what, what you should try is take your darker lip liner, thicken it a little bit right here, and then really start to fill in the outer part of the lips and let your own natural color come through right here and do the same and then you'll get a natural pucker if you teach people that they'll try it they'll see the power of it but guess what some people are so stuck in what they used to do or always did there's no fix in it so i always find gentle ways to say oh my god have you considered this have you tried this oh my god guess what this could do and then people are either going to try it or they're not but guess what when you work with your clients that's where you'll be able to show them you want to show your those if you're around these people all the time do that to yourself use your lip liner to create the contour in the lip and then they go oh my god your lips go let me show you how to do it you're going to love this and voila maybe you'll change them right you'll teach them something new um stevie 
Um, shadow Shields, good to use or no? Yeah, yeah, if there's something that you like, absolutely. There's a lot of people who love them. Um, shadow Shields, for people who don't know, they kind of catch a lot of fall away. They make sure things are going where you want them to be. Sure, you know, um, if it's something you want to use, I don't. You know what some people use also? They'll hold makeup sponges in certain places. Um, that's something that, that people also like. But it depends on whether or not you like them. Major Jane, um, you're welcome. She says, thanks. I say, you're welcome. Um, you know, um, eyebrows are sisters, but what about when you have two different eye shapes? For example, an astigmatism makes one more of a uh, football shape. Um, how do you even at, um, do you even it out or leave it? How? Um, some people's, I'll be honest, some people's eyes are, you see that I have two different eyes. One eye is quite a bit bigger than the other. I hate it. Um, but w the way you start correcting those things is eyeliners eyeliners right so let's say that you've got the two eyes that are slightly different shape right so you take one if you add a wedge to this eye this eye is going to open up a little bit more and it's going to match the other one right so you 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 might have to combine or slightly vary the eyeliners make the wedge on one a little bit bigger and all of a sudden you've matched the eyes but it often comes down to the eyeliner itself and you may find if there's major differences between the eyes um, sometimes you can also use the the depth of shadow on one eye to make that eye a little bit bigger and balance them just so but that's a does that answer your question it's you can normally solve it with the eyeliner and that's gonna be where the real powerful thing is it so, but don't don't be afraid those wedges are so powerful and people don't always know exactly what they do all right so um, next up Anna my question is you've over plucked your eyebrows since the 70s and 80s guess what almost everybody has from that area my mom included so many people right it's it was the trend it was the thing to do and eyebrows don't always grow back so you have star sparse eyebrows you've watched people on YouTube tutorials however your brows always look so fake can you help me figure out how to make your brows better um, well the first question I'd have for you is are you one of our students because if you're one of our students um, in the in the master makeup artistry course and in the pro makeup workshop we go through that several times right we teach everybody how to do it if you're not I'm gonna give you a quick um, a quick redo but that might really interest you to to take that course right or even you know if you're only more interested in your own personal makeup there is a course only for people who want to learn personal makeup and it's only three units think about microblading keep your pencil extremely extremely sharp okay um, oh, and Kelly, I'm going to answer that question about pores. Um, Karina, don't let me forget that question about pores. I got an awesome product that will blow your mind. Um, take your sharp pencil and draw the hair-like lines one by one, and it will look like a natural eyebrow. Microblading looks so incredibly, incredibly, incredibly natural, right? So what was around before microblading, and what is it I teach in the videos? Look at the direction of hair growth. Do you see how here they grow up? And then they start to grow out and then they grow out and then they start to angle to the side and down so when you start to draw those in with a super super sharp pencil don't be pen sharpen it three four times keep it super sharp you will absolutely make your eyebrows look like they grew that way it's something I taught because my mom's um, start started a little further out I taught her how to put them in and hers like most women's oh, I know it stinks right they started to get really thin out here so I taught her how to add those she now does it to herself like a pro. It's fine, tight lines, all right? And they will really make your eyebrow look natural. Don't do the stencil-like look. Don't do the ombre. It looks really, 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 really fake. Should you apply eyeshadow or foundation first? I, everybody's different. I do eyeshadows first for two reasons. One, I hate fall away, and I find you can never get it all out. Number two, you can always put a little foundation here and soften those lines, which makes it look amazing. Um, all right, so here we go. Um, Amy, Amy Michelle, can you use just one clear nude lip liner for any lipstick color? Um, you just have so many lipsticks. Yeah, of course you can. You can. But the other thing, too, is um, when you use reds, you're never going to get that crisp, sharp line without a pencil. You just won't. So it doesn't hurt to, for a couple of your really dark shades, I'd have a clear or a nude, but for a couple of your dark shades like it's always good to have a red because guess what your that your one red lip liner can lip work for all your red lipsticks because once you get that red lipstick on it the the pigment of the red lipstick is going to bleed into the pigment of the lip liner it'll work it ends up working so i would have our red and i would have a burgundy to make sure you can get those super crisp lines okay that's what um that's what i that's what i would recommend all right amanda how do you create um gradient color on small hooded eyes um, well, what you got to do, the thing that you have to do, and I know this is going to seem a little odd, but it's a balancing act. So I think you're talking about the gradient color where it starts out 
super dark and then gradiates gently up the smoldering smoky eye right so what do you have to do the mistake and my eye is a great example because do you see how i have a recessed eye most of my lid disappears and a huge amount of it's up there in the crack of my eye so what you have to do is you've got to get your dark color here and you can bring it all the way up that's okay but then you have to open the eye and you have to go okay well that became a really dark line then you start your gradient right here then you start gradiating up but it all has to happen in a small place it's a challenge that's why I have people work on the back of the arm with the blush when you can learn to gradiate the colors back here in that way you can gradiate in a small area so you got to be nice and t dark and dent dense here and it stays dark because then when you blink it won't look funny and then the gradient starts on the rounded part of the skin all right that's how you make it happen and then it gradiates up. How do you blend two colors without making it look harsh? Often you need that mid-tone shade. So you often need the shade between the two to help them go one into the next. That's one of the best ways to do that. Um, I hope, Amanda, that answered your question, right? So instead of, like, imagine that the whole eye was flat. Here you could just gradiate it up. You just got to imagine that this is the closed eye and then it's dark and then the gradation starts there and it might have to go a little bit higher but that makes it happen okay um let's see here um the pour the magic magic magical um product um paula's choice and she makes them for all different skin types okay she um she has a product called skin perfecting two percent bha liquid guys in a couple of weeks, you'll notice changes in your skin. Every one of my clients uses it now. Everyone in my, even my brother, everybody in my family is using it. It, what it does is the BHAs, the salicylic acid in it, it's the right percentage and it works like Mr. Pac-Man. It eats away the dead skin cells on the surface of the skin, but it also goes in and it eats the skin that's expanding your pores, that's clogging and plugging up your pores. And then it goes in and it clears out your bacteria, allowing the inner part of the pore to refine so your pores get smaller. It really works. Now, if you, you, know, um, if you have stretched some and they're damaged, there's nothing you can do. If you've ever burst a pore, the elasticity's gone. That can never go back. But if they're like, you see how, um, God, I don't know if I can show you. I have some bigger pores here and there. They've gotten much smaller, um, you know, from it they've gotten much smaller um let me see is there anything else here um the questions about droopy eyes and how to balance them guys it's the eyeliner it's all those techniques that i showed you guys on eyeliner and the angles and the lifts it's the angle and the lift of your eyeliner now if one of them's way more droopy than the other you just need a little bit more lift to this liner and i promise you everything will change so have the angle here balance the angle there and all of a sudden you'll notice but it's it's an experimentation guys it's it's math it's changing the angle but it's different for person to person because everybody though like say one pulls down a little bit more than the other it's just a slight angle but if you don't want to give them a cat don't give them a cat it's the wedge it's the wedge right okay um there are a lot of questions okay so you know what she's telling me now is that um and, and guys, um, don't worry because you'll all get a link to this. Um, Karina's told me that there are a lot more questions, that there are a ton more questions. And guys, any of you, if your question wasn't answered, continue writing them down here. Because what we're going to do, if you guys aren't aware, I do a blog post every month. Um, and if you, if you guys aren't seeing that blog, get used to looking at the blog because I give you guys a lot of information in there that will be valuable to you. Write out all your questions here. We're going to turn it into a blog post and they will all, um, and we'll have it up. Um, usually my blog posts come closer to the end of the month, but this year we'll make sure it comes um, at the beginning of the month. If you guys put all your questions up, these questions pertaining directly to this webinar will be my next blog post and they will all be up for you guys to see. Okay? So no questions have been overlooked, but because I've already had you for close to two hours, um, we don't want to take any more of your time. So what I want you guys to do is put all your questions down and it's going to be a blog for the very next time um, we got it. And you guys will all, um, Karina will see to it that every one of you is emailed a link to that blog, okay? So everybody who tuned into this, all of our students as a whole, everyone will get that link and it will be up and available for you guys to read, okay? So nobody's going to be overlooked ever, now or ever, so just leave your questions below, okay? So um, I started to say a little while ago, I say it at the end of every one of my webinars, I love each and every one of you. You do a beautiful thing by be bringing beauty to people because you can change people's confidence self-esteem and the way they look at the world okay and that's a huge thing especially in these trying times that are wherever we live 
wherever we live, people are always undermining our confidence, our self-esteem. People always tell us we aren't good enough for one reason or another, and guess what? We are. Every one of you are, and you guys are soldiers in this world because you're making everybody feel spectacular, and that's a pretty fantastic thing. Um, and I'm proud of you guys. I'm proud of you guys, and I love each and every one of you for all that you bring to the world and all the good that you contribute. So thanks for making people feel so great. I will see you incredibly, incredibly soon. I love each and every one of you. And until next time, don't forget, write your questions below. I promise you they will be in a blog post, and they will be very cohesively answered. Um, okay, I love each and every one of you, and I'll see you really, really soon. Thanks for tuning in. Goodbye, my darlings.